In almost every mystery story, there is a victim. Now, whether Ira Mullins was a victim of his own making remains to be seen. However, he is nonetheless the victim of the Pound Gap Massacre. There were three attempts on his person for his life, and the last one succeeded. This is a timeline of those events that led to the death of Ira. But was he really the target of the massacre? Could it be that someone else was the actual target? As we get into the life of Ira, we shall see why everyone for the last 130 years has thought that he was the actual target. In May 1879, Henry Vanover's niece, Polly Lorenza Estep, the daughter of his sister Mary and John Estep, married Ira Mullins, the son of John L. and Martha Mullins of Pike County. And a little over a year later, the first of many troubles would arise between Ira Mullins and Henry Vanover. It is unknown if Mullins actually did any sharecropping work for the Vanovers during this time. However, it is well known that he made money from the occupation of Moonshiner. This occupation is often cited as the reason that would lead to his making many enemies and is the ultimate reason behind three death attempts. Mullins went hunting for a wife. He chose the niece of Henry Vanover, Luenza Estep, a mountain beauty with raven hair. She offered him the opportunity to be a sharecropper for Vanover. In that deal, Mullins would live in the cabin on Vanover land in exchange for work done for the family. Lorenza and Ira would have only one child together, John Harrison Mullins. Ira, or Bad Ira Mullins, as he was locally known, was a big-time moonshiner and corn whiskey runner by trade. It is also said that he was a small-time merchant as well, but we could find no record of him owning a general store or mercantile on the Elkhorn Creek. It is possible that he later owned such a business in Virginia, but it is also just as likely that his business or story of it is used as a front for his illegal endeavors. On October 21, 1880, Ira Mullins would be arrested fine $25 and spend 10 days in the Whitesburg, Kentucky jail. The only information we can find about the case is that the indictment which states that Ira was carrying a concealed and deadly weapon. The indictment was used by the jury to record the sentence and the fine. And as a scratch pad by the county clerk to tabulate $12.85 in court fees. The indictment lists the witnesses for the Commonwealth as well. Morgan Killers, Henry Vanover, and a man that is repeatedly associated with the story of Pound Gap Massacre, Isaac Belcher. In the mid-1880s, Ira and Luanza Mullins moved to Elkhorn Creek and settled in a cabin that was built on a plot of land owned by Henry Vanover. Although Henry informed Ira and his niece that the property and the cabin in which they were now living was owned by him, there is nothing to indicate that he asked them to leave either verbally or in a court record. What we do know is about this time, someone started trying to kill Henry Vanover. On June 18, 1887, while working in the fields in Rocky Hollow with his wife, Henry Vanover was ambushed and killed. Although the actual killer of Henry Vanover remains unknown, it is widely thought that Clifton Branham had murdered Henry Vanover. Branham was arrested and tried for the crime, although there was little evidence and Branham claimed to be at home with his wife and family that day. He was convicted of conspiracy and criminal complicity and would spend 15 years of a 90-year term in prison. After Henry's death, his widow Sarah was left to raise their children on her own. However, Having a large timber producing estate did not make it easier, as at one point Sarah was facing 100 lawsuits from people claiming Henry's land, including a lawsuit from Ira and Louenza Mullins. Doc Taylor was a close friend of Henry Vanover's and became involved in several of the lawsuits against the widow Vanover, including one with Ira Mullins. If Clifton Branham had knowledge of who actually killed Henry Vanover, he kept silent about it. 
He also never told who he had received money from for the assassination. However, everyone suspected that it was from Ira Mullins and his wife Lorenza. There is a tale where Dr. Taylor was involved in a shootout. Taylor and his posse rode into the town of Wise in pursuit of a wagon load of whiskey owned by Ira Mullins, where a gunfight exploded on the streets in front of the courthouse. According to the oft-told tale, approximately 250 bullets were exchanged, leaving the driver of the wagon dead and several others injured. It is said that Ira was shot and paralyzed during this event in Wise, Virginia. According to the oft-told tale, Doc Taylor was fired from being a United States Marshal for the shootout, but there is no historical record that we could find of the shootout happening in Wise, Virginia. However, there is a newspaper article that says that Ira Mullins had received his paralyzing injuries in a shootout with revenuers in Mountain Home, Tennessee, over a year prior to the Killing Rock Massacre. According to the testimony of W.M. Mullins, this event took place two years before the events of the massacre. Most people figured that it was the shootout at Wise, Virginia that started the feud between Dr. Taylor and Ira Mullins. However, it is of particular interest to note that Taylor would become a federal marshal in 1889, two years after the death of Henry Vanover, and start his war with the Moonshiners. It is also telling in the fact that Taylor chose the pursuit and capture of moonshine runners coming from Kentucky into Virginia. Taylor was known to camp out at what is now known as Raven Rock and spy on the road using his five-foot spyglass and then set a trap for the runners at the top of the mountain. Jemima Harris states that she had lived with Ira Mullins all of that spring because he was paralyzed and couldn't help himself. She stated that he could not feed himself without help. Mr. Robert Mullins was then asked if he knew why Ira had been found in the wagon. The transcript tells us that he replied, quote, Ira Mullins was paralyzed, could not feed himself, and had to be hauled from place to place in a wagon, unquote. As we will state in this next section, two witnesses would come forward. Both would claim that Dr. Taylor spoke to them about Ira sending out a call to pay someone $100 for them to kill Doc before that Saturday. Why? There is a huge possibility that this was for Doc's testimony on behalf of the widow Vanover. That Doc was testifying against Ira Mullins' claims to the land after the death of Henry Vanover. It is also a possibility that Mullins was about to lose his court case and that he blamed Doc for his testimony. This would make sense as we have no other reason for this claim because Dr. Taylor had recently given up his time as the United States Marshal. Please see who is Doc Taylor. Sometime in April of 1892, there was a shootout at the Mullins cabin located in Pound, Virginia. According to the Richmond Dispatch, a number of unknown men went to his house and opened fire on the cabin. Several shots went through the window and lodged into the bed of Ira Mullins. Several friends arrived at the cabin and were able to save Ira from death. They hid him under a pile of freight in a covered wagon and spirited him away to safety. Noah Hubbard, Jemima Harris, and Doc Swindle would all testify about the shooting at the cabin. Noah Hubbard would further testify that he and Doc Taylor would have a conversation at his house about the shooting of Ira Mullins. He said that Dr. Taylor told him that, quote, some person or persons had shot through Ira Mullins' window into his bedclothes, but it was not him, unquote. The witness testified that this was because Ira Mullins had offered $100 to have Dr. Taylor killed on Saturday. However, Ira's bed was shot into on Sunday. The witness then stated that Dr. Taylor had told him that he was in Kentucky when Ira Mullins had offered the reward to have him killed. Hubbard then stated that, quote, 
He said that he was going to keep in the brush and keep the law on his side. Unquote. Dr. Swindle testified, I live 150 yards from Ira Mullins' house and I saw him the Sunday before he was killed. Dr. M.B. Taylor stayed all night at my house on Saturday night before Ira Mullins was killed. He asked me about Ira and said that Ira had offered $100 for his life. I was in bed when he came to my house. He asked me to get up and come out on the porch that he wanted to talk to me. He said that sometime after Ira had offered the reward to have him, that is Taylor, killed, someone had shot into his, that being Ira, his bed. But it wasn't me and laughed and said that he was aiming to come up to big trouble. He said there was aiming to come up big trouble and that the Fleming boys would not bother me and Colonel Swindle anymore and that he had that fixed. Unquote. Jemima Harris states that, quote, about three weeks before he was killed, someone shot through the window into his bed. The ball went into the shot through the window into his bed. The ball went into the bed covers on which he was lying. The ball looked like a 44 to her. She didn't know that Dr. Taylor carried a 44 pistol. She didn't know where the ball was, unquote. The final murder attempt against Ira Mullins would come just a month later on May 14, 1892. Ira, along with his wife Lorenza, John Chappelle, Greenberry Harris, and Wilson Mullins would all be murdered at the top of Pound Mountain at a place called the Killing Rock. As we have been going through this saga piece by piece, we have discovered that there is far more to this than has often been told. As we continue the trial of Dr. Taylor, one question has eluded everyone. What if someone else in the party was the primary target? We will explore that possibility in a future video. Dr. Marshall Benton Taylor was the son of a Scott County farmer whose family was well known throughout Southwest Virginia. Early in life, he decided to study medicine and become the pupil of his uncle Stallard of Lee County, Virginia, at a time when medical colleges were few and distant. He had only practiced medicine a few months when he answered the call of the Virginia for Troops in 1861. He joined the 64th Virginia Mounted Infantry, but within a few months he returned home telling friends and family that he had enough killing and did not want any more. He soon resumed his professional duties as a doctor. His patients were widely scattered in a sparsely settled section of the border between Virginia and Kentucky. Eventually he would also become the spiritual advisor first as a preacher in the Methodist Church and later of the Swedenborg faith. He lived for a time in Letcher County, Kentucky and spent many quiet years of his life enjoying the company of friends and the confidence of his patients. In 1876, he was accused of the assassination of Robert Moore, an outlaw of Wise County, who was shot and killed in his own home in the presence of his wife late one night. The evidence was not conclusive, but Moore's neighbors were convinced that Taylor was the murderer. He was soon arrested and acquitted of the crime at the trial because no direct testimony was given against him. In 1889, the United States Marshal for Western District of Virginia appointed Taylor for his deputy for Wise County, Virginia. Taylor immediately began a campaign against the moonshiners in the mountainous areas of the Twin States. Doc soon developed a reputation as a revenuer among the people of the mountains, often stopping wagon loads of non-stamped whiskey as it crossed between the two states. But Doc would gain his reputation as a lawman in the extradition and trial of Todd Hall. We don't know when Dr. Taylor gave up being a United States Marshal, but we do know that his last acts as a Marshal happened in January and February of 1892 
when he went to Memphis, Tennessee, for the transport of Tall Tall, and guarded his person until the trial was finished in February. When the Killing Rock murders happened, Taylor was no longer a United States Marshal. This was deeply personal to Dr. Taylor because Tall Tall had been involved in the murder of Police Chief Hilton of Norton, Virginia. The sheriff's wife was the sister-in-law to Taylor's son, Sylvan. There is a tale where Dr. Taylor was involved in a shootout. Taylor and his posse rode into town of Wise in pursuit of a wagon load of whiskey owned by Ira Mullins, where the gunfight exploded on the streets in front of the courthouse. According to the off-toe tale, approximately 250 bullets were exchanged, leaving the driver of the wagon dead and several others injured. It is said that Ira Mullins was shot and paralyzed during the event in Wise, Virginia. According to the off-toe tale, Dr. Taylor was fired from being a United States Marshal for the shootout, but there is no historical record that we can find of a shootout happening in Wise, Virginia. However, there is a newspaper article that says Ira Mullins had received his paralyzing injuries in a shootout with revenuers in Mountain Home, Tennessee, over a year prior to the Killing Rock Massacre. Most people figured that the shootout in Wise, Virginia that started the feud between Dr. Marshall Benton Taylor and Ira Mullins. However, it is of particular interest to note that Taylor would become a federal marshal in 1889, two years after the death of Henry Vanover, and start his war against moonshiners. It is also telling in the fact that Taylor chose the pursuit and capture of moonshine runners coming from Kentucky into Virginia. Taylor was also known to camp out at what is now known as Raven Rock and spy on the road using his five-foot spyglass and then set a trap for the runners at the top of the mountain. Talton Hall had been suspected in the murder of 19 men in Perry County. Although a large reward was offered for his capture and arrest, no one wanted to go after Hall because of his reputation. However, on July 14, 1891, Hall murdered Police Chief Hilton of Norton, Virginia. Knowing that there was too much evidence against him, Hall fled the area and went to Memphis, Tennessee, where he was finally captured. Memphis police needed a lawman and Hilton's widow to come to Memphis, Tennessee to positively identify Hall and extradite him back to Gladeville, now Wise, Virginia, for trial. Doc Taylor volunteered to go for personal reasons. His daughter-in-law's sister was the widow of Hilton, and Hilton had been a close personal friend of the family. Upon their return, Doc extended his personal duties to guard Hall, as there had been many attempts to release him from the Wise County Jail during the week of his trial. After sentencing, Taylor would once again transport Hall to Lynchburg, Virginia to await his execution. It is some time after the delivery of Hall to Lynchburg Jail that Taylor would resign his post as United States Marshal. Bad Talt, Talton Hall, was executed by hanging for the murder of a police officer on September 2, 1892. He was 42 years old. Three months after the delivery of Talton Hall to the Lynchburg, Virginia Jail, would the events of the Killing Rock Massacre transpire? There is an off-told tale that Taylor left his guard duties in Wise, Virginia to commit the crime. This is now debunked as Hall was in the Lynchburg jail at the time of the murders. We have often stated that even the smallest of things that are said in a story passed down by the word of mouth or recorded in books and newspapers often lead to a treasure of information. However, in the case of the Pound Gap Massacre, some of them have led to even more unanswered questions. And one of the biggest mysteries and by far the largest unanswered question in the story of Killing Rock is, who is Amanda Jane Mullins? The only hard concrete evidence easily found on Jane Mullins is that she was Wilson's wife. This is verified by the 1880 census where she is listed in Pike County in the Upper Elkhorn Creek District simply as Jane Mullins' wife. We are told from the various websites that she is Ira Mullins' sister. However, some sites claim that she was his daughter. 
but there is no evidence for her being his daughter and the genealogy websites listing her as his sister are contradictory. Some have her listed as Amanda Jane Mullins with a birth date listed as born about 1855, while others have her with a birth date ranging from 1851 to 1857, while some have no birth date for her at all. By far, the strangest websites has Amanda Mullins listed with a birth date of May 5th, 1855, and another sister named Jane Mullins with no birth date or some of these sites even have them listed the other way around. Combine this with the fact that there is no clear evidence for her death or the date and Jane Mullins becomes an enigma. There are two clues found in the story of the apprehension of the Fleming brothers. In this story we are told that Cal was killed and Heenan was captured. However, the story goes that when Heenan comes to trial on July 24, 1894, he is acquitted because Jane Mullins had died, even though that we are told Heenan had made a full confession. This statement is odd to say the least, but for now we will focus on this clue and come back to this story in a later episode. This puts Jane's death at a fixed point sometime before July 1894. But at the Potter Murdered Man Cemetery, her grave has a marking stating that she passed away on February 15, 1892, which is nearly three months before the massacre. Some websites give her death as being February 15, 1895. The genealogy sites are of no help either, as they have her death ranging from 1892 to 1948. This in itself is further complicated in the fact that there is another Jane Mullins in the story. Rebecca Jane Mullins was the daughter of Booker Basil, also known as Cripple Basil Mullins, and America Baker. She was born on May 5th, 1885, and had a sister named Amanda M. Mullins, born in 1857, who married Benjamin Taylor. However, Rebecca supposedly had two children by Doc Taylor, and although Doc Taylor bought her a house on Bold Camp in the Pound, they would never marry. We will look at this story in a later episode as well. Rebecca and her sister Amanda were first cousins to Jane's husband, Wilson Mullins. Ira and his sister Jane were also the first cousins with Wilson. There is another remarkable similarities between the two Janes. However, according to the 1870 census, Jane Mullins is the wife of Wilson and a sister to Ira was named Amoda Jane Mullins. This explains why the two genealogies had reported that she was also known as Mona. She was born on May 5, 1855, as well as had a daughter with Wilson named Amarinda or Mindy Mullins who was born in 1881. Rebecca Jane Mullins had a daughter in 1885 named America or Mandy Mullins. We believe that, just like us, when we first started researching the massacre, most people get into these two women being mixed up. However, we certainly did when we first encountered the coincidence in their names, birth dates, and names of the daughters. This would certainly explain the contradicting dates for Jane Mullins. But it is our belief that Amanda M. Mullins has also gotten mixed up into the character of Jane Mullins as one of the birth dates for Jane matches hers. Amanda also married a man named Taylor, and even though they were never married, Rebecca Jane is sometimes called Marshall Benton Taylor's second wife. Therefore, we believe a multiple of stories and websites report our sister's name as being Amanda Jane Mullins because both Amanda and her sister Rebecca were both tied to, married, or considered as a second wife to a man named Taylor. While it is true that an 1860 census report states that Jane Mullins is Amanda, when reviewing the actual microfilm of the census, her name is spelled A-M-O-D-A, -A, Amoda Jane Mullins. It very well may be that this document which is the source of the entire mix-up of these three women. Finally, when we discover Jane's real name, that we are able to find her in the birth and death registries. 
However, the mystery that is Jane Mullins does not stop here. As we stated, we found the grave of Jane Mullins Belcher in the Potter Cemetery. Her grave is found beside the grave of Elizabeth Belcher. Elizabeth was the first wife of Jane's second husband, Isaac Belcher, and the sister of James Potter a man whose name repeatedly comes up when deep searching the Pound Gap Massacre, but more on him in a later episode of the story. Her gravestone tells us that she died on August 20th, 1892. Jane married Isaac Belcher on October of that same year, seven to ten days after Jane was released from protective custody. In addition to the three oddities the name Isaac Belcher came up when we investigated the murder of Henry Vanover and Ira's possible connection to his death. What we found was an interesting court document. The document tells us that Isaac Belcher and Henry Vanover were the primary witnesses against Ira Mullins in a criminal court case shortly before the death of Henry. This prompted us to take a closer look at Isaac Belcher in his relationship with all those involved. This, in turn, brought up another question. Did Jane marry an enemy of her brother seven to ten days after being released from protective custody? While digging for information on this, we discovered a possible cause for Elizabeth Potter Belcher's death. A newspaper had reported that a woman had died on Little Elkhorn Creek from her injuries after falling into an open fireplace while cooking dinner. While the article gives no name for the woman, the date is given August 20th, 1892. Elizabeth Grave has an interesting epitaph as it reads, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. While this seems innocent enough, when we know how and when she died, and consider Isaac Belcher's sudden romance and marriage to Jane Mullins, it seems strange to say the least, especially after we found the truth about Jane's death and discovered even stranger epitaph on Jane's grave. Right next to Elizabeth, we find the grave of Jane Belcher. As we have already said, it has her death occurring on February 15, 1892. We discovered that her death occurred on February 15, 1894. Why the mistake? Could it have been deliberate? It is often reported that Jane died in childbirth, and we found that this is the story told in the family as told to us directly by Jane's great-great-great-grandson. We had been interviewing him through a social media application. He was shocked and refused to believe us when we told him how Jane actually died. After producing the newspaper clip, he became upset with us and ended the interview, accusing us of digging up a past that no one wanted to know. The epitaph on Jane Belcher's grave is shocking especially when taking everything that we have just discussed into account. The epitaph reads, quote, faithful with her trust until death, unquote. So, what secret of Isaac Belcher's did she take to the grave? We think that her death may tell us. We also have a lot of people who have gone to great lengths in order to cover up that death. She has been confused with at least two other women, and her identity has been obscured with them. Her death and the date of that death had been hidden by the false identity and the wrong date on her tombstone. But according to the Roanoke Times, in the story dated February 16, 1894, Jane Mullins Belcher was murdered the previous day. The story tells us that the suspect is Orban Orb Fleming, younger brother to Cal and Hendon Fleming. The reporter suggests that the shooter hid in the brush some distance from the cabin. However, there are a few particulars that this story does not tell us. A few days earlier, newspapers were reporting that Hennon Fleming was expected to make a full recovery from his mortal injury, at which time he would be expedited back to Wise County to stand trial. These reports state that Hennon was claiming that his full confession was made under duress as medical treatment for his wounds were withheld until he had confessed to his part in the massacre. As it would turn out, Orb Fleming had been in Gladeville, now wise, on the 15th, talking to his brother's lawyers in an effort to have Hennon's confession thrown out. Orb's alibi was rock solid, as later that day it also involved the judge. 
Jane had perjured herself in the trial of Doc Taylor, and her eyewitness standing in any upcoming trial of Hennon was questionable. Finally, according to one source, Jane Mullins Belcher had been killed by a single gunshot to the back of her head as she exited her home. There are no remaining pictures of the women named Jane that can be found online. The families, if they have them, are not sharing them publicly. So in place of the photos, we have decided to place pictures of the area as existed before 1910 as closely as we possibly can. Henry Vanover was born in 1835 to Daniel and Nancy Vanover. During the Civil War, he served as a private with the Union Army. After the war, the U.S. government deeded him 900 acres of land in lieu of pay for his service. This land is located approximately two miles down the Elkhorn Creek from the present-day town of Jenkins, Kentucky. The land stretched across both sides of the Elkhorn Creek and includes the present-day sites of Burdine, East Jenkins, what is now called Number 3 Hollow, Joe's Branch, and Camden. Henry never sold any land. However, from time to time, he would sell walnut, maple, and oak timber from the land and use the proceeds to purchase more land. Henry had acquired some of the richest, choicest timberland in Kentucky and Virginia. As he continued to selectively log, he became a wealthy man and the owner of large tracts of land in both states. It is of importance to note here that coal had not yet been developed on the Elkhorn Creek in Kentucky. But in 1883, Richard Bros came to the area and started his survey on Henry Vanover's land. It was in this way that Henry discovered that not only did he own some of the best timberlands in both states, but in Kentucky he had been granted a significant portion of the richest coal land in the country by the U.S. government. However, as quite a few people can attest, with the acquisition of wealth and valuable land, problems arise. In May 1879, Henry Vanover's niece, Polly Lorenza Estep, the daughter of his sister Mary and John Estep, married Ira Mullins, the son of John L. and Martha Mullins of Pike County. And a little over a year later, the first of many troubles would arise between Ira Mullins and Henry Vanover. Ira, or Bad Ira Mullins, as he was locally known, was a big-time moonshiner and corn whiskey runner by trade. It is also said that he was a small-time merchant as well, but we could find no record of him owning a general store or mercantile on the Elkhorn Creek. It is possible that he later owned such a business in Virginia, but it is also just as likely that his business or story of it is used as a front for his illegal endeavors. On October 21, 1880, Ira Mullins would be arrested, fined $25, and spend 10 days in the Whitesburg, Kentucky jail. The only information we can find about the case is that the indictment which states that Ira was carrying a concealed and deadly weapon. The indictment was used by the jury to record the sentence and the fine. And as a scratch pad by the county clerk to tabulate $12.85 in court fees. The indictment lists the witnesses for the Commonwealth as well. Morgan Killers, Henry Vanover, and a man that is repeatedly associated with the story of Pound Gap Massacre, Isaac Belcher. In the mid-1880s, Ira and Luanza Mullins moved to Elkhorn Creek and settled in a cabin that was built on a plot of land owned by Henry Vanover. Although Henry informed Ira and his niece that the property and the cabin in which they were now living was owned by him, there is nothing to indicate that he asked them to leave, either verbally or in a court record. What we do know is about this time, someone started trying to kill Henry Vanover. After a hard day's work on May 28, 1885, Henry and his family were sitting on the porch of his home, having dinner and enjoying the cool evening breeze. A man riding a horse was casually traveling by the Vanover home. This man stopped in the middle of the Elkhorn Creek in front of Henry's home. At that time, the creek was in use as a road. After calmly sitting there for a few minutes, the man drew his rifle and began shooting at Henry and his family. 
Henry quickly grabbed his rifle and returned fire. The would-be assassin spurred his horse and quickly rode off, but apparently not before Henry recognized the man. The attempted assassin was a man named James Roberts from Ohio, who was known to be a guest staying at the home of Ira Mullins. Henry then decided to wait and see if the man would attempt to ride by his home again. When he later appeared on the road, Henry Vanover opened fire, shooting Roberts from his horse and killing him. Henry Vanover was charged with the murder of Mr. Roberts, but was acquitted due to circumstances. But the troubles for Henry and his family did not end there. Most stories about Henry Vanover tells us that, on June 18, 1887, while working the fields in Rocky Hollow with his wife, Henry Vanover was ambushed and killed. Although the actual killer of Henry Vanover remains unknown, it is widely thought that Clifton Branham had murdered Henry Vanover. Clifton was arrested and tried for the crime, although there was very little evidence, and Clifton claimed to be at home with his wife and family that day. He was convicted of conspiracy and criminal complicity and would spend 15 years of a 90-year term in prison. Clifton always denied the Vanover murder and claimed, quote, I got some money for the killing, but I did not kill Henry Vanover, unquote. But thanks to digitalization efforts that have taken place over the last 10 years, we can now piece a different story together. On page 8 of the Kentucky newspaper, the Hazel Green Herald, dated Friday, August 12, 1887, is two sentences. They simply tell us that Clifton Branham and his brother, Tan, were in jail charged with the killing of Vanover. They made a confession implicating several others. Tan was Clifton's brother, Tandy Branham. They were both given life sentences in the Kentucky State Prison at Frankfort in Franklin County for the murder of Henry Vanover. But according to page 3 of the Hopkinsville Kentuckian, dated June the 24th, 1892, Tandy Brandon was one of the, quote, unfortunates, unquote, serving a life sentence for murder in the Eddyville Penitentiary, who was adjudicated insane and sent to an asylum. Although we can find no exact date, Tandy was released from the asylum prior to August 1896. We know this thanks to two Kentucky newspaper clippings from August and November of that year. The first comes from the Daily Leader, now the Lexington Herald, dated August the 12th, 1896. The second is from the Richmond Climax, dated November 25th, 1896. These two papers inform us that Tandy was murdered on August 11th, and although his killer had been caught, he refused to give his name. The second clip tells us that his killer was 18-year-old Coon Willis and informs us that Mr. Willis pleaded guilty and received a life sentence instead of facing jail and informs us that Mr. Willis pleaded guilty and received a life sentence instead of facing trial. Clifton's story is a little more interesting. Clifton and Tandy apparently took a similar deal to that of Coon Willis choosing life in prison rather than face trial and the gallows. Clifton's story is summarized and can be found on page 11 of the Louisville, Kentucky's Courier-Journal dated September the 26th, 1903. In 1899, Clifton would follow the footsteps of his brother Tandy and feign insanity. He would then be transferred to the Eastern Kentucky Lunatic Asylum in Lexington, Kentucky. Clifton would spend a total of six months in the asylum before he was released. In all, Clifton Branham would spend 12 years locked up for the murder of Henry Vanover. Clifton would be tried and hung for the murder of his wife in 1903. However, there is another oddity in the story about Clifton Branham and the murder of Henry. The story tells us that, quote, the actual killer of Henry Vanover remains unknown. It was widely thought that Clifton Branham had murdered Henry Vanover, unquote. It goes on to tell us that, quote, Clifton always denied the Vanover murder and claimed, I got some money for the killing, but I did not kill Henry Vanover, unquote. Some websites are now reporting in snippets that there was a third man who was tried and sent to prison for the murder of Henry Vanover at the same time these snippets are found on genealogy websites and articles about both men, 
and give this third man's name as George Johnson. After an exhaustive search, we can find no mention of any man associated with the murder of Henry Vanover other than those asserting that Ira Mullins was the man who paid the Branham brothers. We did find that Clifton and Tandy confessed to the crime implicating others. Was George Johnson one of the persons implicated in the confession? Or is it possible that this is a distortion to hide the simple truth? In several of the stories about Clifton Branham, we are told that he was quite the ladies' man. It is even implied that it was one of the reasons he spent so much time away from home and his wife. We are also told that Clifton was also fond of an alias that he often used on these occasions. Clifton often used the alias George Jones. Could it be that the third man was actually a split personality? Could it be that both Clifton and Tandy Branham were both insane? After Henry's death, his widow Sarah was left to raise their children on their own. However, having a large timber-producing estate did not make it any easier. At one point, Sarah was facing 100 lawsuits from people claiming Henry's land, including a lawsuit from Ira and Louenza Mullins. About this time, Henry Vanover's oldest daughter, Catherine, had caught the eye of Henan Fleming, and he and his brother Calvin were often visitors at the Vanover house helping with the farm. Eventually, Henan would marry Catherine. Doc Taylor was a close friend of Henry Vanover's and became involved in several of the lawsuits against the widow Vanover, including one with Ira Mullins. If Clifton Brenham had knowledge of who actually killed Henry Vanover, he kept silent about it. He also never told who he had received money from for the assassination. However, everyone suspected that it was from Ira Mullins and his wife Lorenza. Most people figured that it was a shootout at Wise that started the feud between Dr. Marshall Benton Taylor and Ira Mullins. However, it is of particular interest to note that Taylor would become a federal marshal in 1889, two years after the death of Henry Vanover, and start his war against moonshiners. It is also telling in the fact that Taylor chose the pursuit and the capture of moonshine runners coming from Kentucky into Virginia. Taylor was also known to camp out at what is now known as Raven Rock and spy on the road below using his five-foot spyglass and then set a trap for the runners at the top of the mountain. Over the next four years, Taylor would lead an assault against the illegal whiskey that many came to say was his personal vendetta against moonshiners. He would also gain fame as an herbalist and a spiritual leader, often staying with his patients for an extended time until they were well. It is also during this time that he would acquire the nickname the Red Fox and take on a persona of being a mystic. One of the biggest often overlooked mysteries of the Killing Rock Saga is the life of Preston McCalvin Fleming. Who was he? How did he get mixed up in the story of the Pound Gap Massacre? Why did he die in West Virginia by a shootout with the Wise County Posse? Why was he involved with the Vanovers? Born as Preston McCalvin Cal Fleming on October 15th, 1868 in Buchanan County, Virginia to Robert Jefferson, Big Jeff, and Margaret Rose Fleming. He was one of nine brothers and sisters. He is often spoken about with his brother Heenan and the story stops with his death. But we are hoping to shed a little light on who he actually was and if the story about him is true. The popular story is often told that Samuel McKeenan Hennon Fleming, Cal's brother, was sweet upon Catherine Vanover Fleming. It was widely known that Cal was sweet upon another of Henry Vanover's daughters, but it is never told which one of them had caught his eye. However, he is noted to be at the Vanover farm quite a bit with his brother Hennon. Cordelia Cook was born on November 20th, 1875 in Floyd County, Kentucky, to Solomon Cook and C.D. Hall McPeak. She was one of three children born to the Union. It is not clear when or how she met Cal Fleming. According to the Find a Grave Records online, Preston McCalvin Fleming was married to Cordelia Cook sometime in 1889. 
As of this date, we have not found the marriage certificate or the place of the wedding. However, if the marriage is true, then Cal would have been at least 21 years old. He would have been seven years the senior to his bride, Cordelia, who would have been 14 years old at that time. It is also reported that during this union, Lydia Lacosta Fleming was born on December 31, 1890, in Wise, Virginia, to the married pair. Lydia would live to be 85 years old and would be the only child of Cal Fleming. Lydia would die at the age of 85 years old on December 9, 1976, in Clifton Forge, Virginia. After the death of Cal on January 14, 1894, Cordelia Cook Fleming would then marry again to Bryant Washington Francisco in 1898, who was her stepbrother from her mother, C.D. Hall Cook's second marriage. She would die on February 20, 1954, at the age of 78 in Ashcamp, Kentucky. There is a record of the marriage with the state of Kentucky taking place in 1889, but there is no actual date listed. So that leaves us with questions. Common law marriages are common to the mountains, even to this day. Even though there is no certificate of marriage, there is usually a small ceremony with family to let everyone know that the relationship is a permanent and a family and community condoned one. All children born to this union are considered to be legitimate and carry the father's name. Another thing to consider is that they did have a marriage certificate, but were possibly separated at the time. Neither party had filed for divorce in the court system at that time, and Cal was engaged to Cynthia, but they were not able to get married yet. For some reason, the marriage of Cal was never spoken of in the oft-told tale story. Why? Where was his wife and child staying during that time? Why were they not also at the Vanover farm if Cal was staying there, or at his father's home? On June 18, 1887, while working the fields in Rocky Hollow with his wife, Henry Vanover was ambushed and killed. Although the actual killer of Henry Vanover remains unknown, it is widely thought that Clifton Branham had murdered Henry Vanover. Henry Vanover was slain, and the killer was going to go to jail by his own confession, rather than to go to jail and face the gallows. The matter was considered to be closed, even though the Branham brothers repeatedly said that they did not kill Vanover. Let's take a look at Henry Vanover's daughter during the time of Henry's death. We have Catherine Vanover, who was 16, and she was engaged and would later marry Henry Fleming. Cynthia Vanover, who was 10, Vanny Vanover, who was 3, and Sarah Vanover, who was a newborn. So which child is a 21-year-old McAlvin Fleming supposed to be engaged to? This does not make sense at all and was not done at the time in the mountains. Cal would not have been courting the girl during that time because she would have been too young. A girl was usually married at the age of 14 in the mountains, younger if it was an arranged marriage, but it is simply not done for girls under the age of 12 and permission was very rarely granted. If you wish to see the actual dates of the births, refer to find a grave site for Henry Vanover listed in the source information below. By the time of the Killing Rock, the closest possible girl that we think Cal could have been involved with was Cynthia. She would have been 15 by 1892. By that time, she would have been old enough for a relationship with Calvin. However, History does not name her, nor does it really confirm that they were engaged to be married. Could there be another reason for that? Henry Vanover was slain. Henry Vanover's widow, Sarah, was facing over 100 lawsuits over land and had a huge farm to run. Was Cal there working as a possible hired hand for farming? It would be possible that he was a hired hand and got the job because of his older brother was dating and did marry Catherine, the oldest daughter. Another possibility would be that Cal was a sharecropper for Henry Vanover. Back in those days, it would not be out of the ordinary for people who owned large tracts of land to hire out the local men to help tend the ground. Deals would be made for money, 
a place to live, food, or other barters for work that had to be done. Not a lot of things are passed down as to what kind of work that Cal Fleming actually did for Henry Vanover. We do know that Henry did own huge tracts of timberland, and it was also possible that Cal worked for Henry chopping down trees. We will never know for sure, as this part of the story has been lost to us over time. On May 14, 1892, the Doom Mellons party would be killed at the top of Jenkins Pound Mountain, at a place that would now be forever known as Killing Rock. Five people were slain and no motive was ever given for the reason behind the massacre. On May 19th, Jane Mullins would once again change her story. She began telling everyone that Doc Taylor and the Fleming brothers were the shooters and that she had recognized their voices. Before this point of the story, Jane Mullins had repeatedly told everyone that she did not know who they were because they had green masks tied with a black band covering their faces. She had also stated that she tried to save Lorenza by pulling her under the wagon. She went on to say that when a pause in the gunfire came, she yelled out, Boys, for the Lord's sake, do not shoot any more. You have killed them all. Let me stay here with them until someone finds us. But was he really on top of Pound Jenkins Mountain that fateful day? One of the biggest questions behind the Pound Gap Massacre is motive. What possible reason would Cal and Hendon Fleming have for being on Pound Gap that fateful day? The reason handed down for 130 years to us was revenge. But was that so? Why would Cal and his brother Hendon be out for revenge, as is so often reported? Why are the other sons of Henry never mentioned in the stories? Henry had five sons. Jacob, Jake Everman Vanover, who was 27. Ulysses Grant Vanover, who was 14, Patrick Hagen Vanover, who was 11, and Henry Sam Melvin Vanover, who was 9, and James L. Bob Bob Vanover, who was 4. So why is Jake and Ulysses never mentioned in the story? Surely they would be the first to step up wanting revenge for the death of their father, wouldn't they? Another wrinkle in the story is that the Fleming brothers were involved in the massacre is simply time. Henry Vanover was shot in his cornfield on June 18, 1887. The Killing Rock Massacre happened on May 14, 1892. So if the whole reason was for revenge, would it not stand a reason that it would not take five years for the Fleming brothers to do something? If they were the hotheads that history has claimed that they were, it would stand to reason that as soon as the Brennan brothers were accused of the crime, that they would have went after them instead. So why go after Ira Mullins? Another possible twist we have come across is the 100 lawsuits that Sarah Vanover faced from the squatters on her land. Ira Mullins and his wife Lorenza was among those that was suing the poor widow. So again, why go after them if they were all in a court of law? Did Ira have the strongest claim to the land? So why shoot Ira and his family? Why wait the five years to do it? And exactly what did Cal and Hennon have to do with it at all, if anything? While doing research on Cal Fleming and his possible engagement, another possible motive as to why they were fingered in the crime came to us. What if someone didn't like it that the Fleming brothers were going to marry the richest marriageable ladies in the area of Jenkins? Cynthia and Catherine were both of marriageable age by 1892, and the land that their father had left behind was a gold mine in timber and coal. There would be many men that would have loved to have them as their brides for both them and their inheritance. The reason why we have thought that there is another suitor is because of what happened to one of Henry's daughters during this time. After the death of Henry, one of his daughters in the off-told tales was beaten almost to death. There is also a possibility that she was violated. Why? For what purpose? It was after this happened that the widow Vanover sold the land to John Wright and left the area with her family. It is often thought that Louisa had a money bag upon her person with at least a thousand dollars or more inside of it. The money bag was missing at the time that her body was found. Robbery has always been associated with the crime because of this. 
However, if the Fleming brothers were both living on the Vanover farm for either work or love, why would they be involved in a robbery? After all, Henry Vanover's widow had inherited all of his money and land, and they were staying with her. No money was ever found or said to be found with the Fleming brothers, so if robbery was the motive for the crime, it would make no sense that they would have been involved. We will get into the story of the West Virginia battle in another untold tale of the Killing Rock Massacre. As we have already stated in the Killing Rock, the off-told tale, part two, there was a failed arrest attempt made. The events of July 17, 1892, would lead to the men going on the run for what they presume is for their very lives. Two men would run to West Virginia, one man would attempt to run to Florida, and one man would flee to parts unknown. Cal and Samuel Hennon Fleming, along with Dr. Marshall Benton Taylor, and possibly Henry Clay Adams, were at the cliffs of the mountain. The men were awaiting for a response to the three letters that were sent to the sheriff to escort them to Wise County to give evidence to the events of the Killing Rock Massacre. R.D. McFall would ask the sheriff to become deputized to go retrieve the men. It was agreed upon, and 20 men went with McFall to the cliff of the mountain. It did not go well as a shootout occurred. It was not until after the shootout that the sheriff would learn that McFall and Taylor were actually enemies. R.D. McFall and Booker Mullins would both testify that Booker had slipped in the mud and his weapon had discharged. Both testified that Doc Taylor and the Flemings only began shooting at them after Booker's rifle had discharged. Both had tried unsuccessfully to express that Taylor and the Flemings opening fire upon the posse was in some way a surprise to them. Both received a scathing reprimand from the judge. The four men who were fearing for their lives would go into three different directions trying to escape from what they thought was a murder attempt. Only Henry Clay Adams would never be found until he was acquitted in 1901 after he had already posted bail and after he had turned himself in in June 1892. It has never been stated in any of the stories where Henry went during this time on a run. There are some theories that he went to Missouri, but no evidence has been found if that is actually where he went. Dr. Taylor would hide in his attic for several days. His son Sylvan helped him to escape the area. Taylor was found and arrested and brought back to Wise County, Virginia to face trial. For the story on how that happened, please refer to Killing Rock, The off Toe Tales, Part 3, The Arrest of Taylor. The following is a summarized story as given by E.J. Doc Swindle. The story can be found at A Narrative History of Wise County, Virginia by Charles A. Johnson. The Fleming brothers decided to make their escape to West Virginia. There was a reward posted for their capture and arrest, and it is disputed as to the amount that the reward was set for. John Branham, Ed Hall, and E.J. Doc Swindle were deputized to go capture the fugitives. There were letters that were intercepted from the Fleming brothers as to their hiding location. Through these letters, it was determined the location of the post office and the men had the addresses and the assumed names. The men boarded a train in Norton, Virginia and traveled to Bluefield, West Virginia. It is reported that the deputized men traveled for seven days on foot in January weather to find the men. On January 14, 1894, after staying all night in Boggs, West Virginia, one of the men was confronted by the Fleming brothers as they were staking out the post office. Posing as a taxman, the confrontation did not get violent. The man was able to go back and get help as the Fleming brothers went on to conduct their business at the store and post office. As the Fleming brothers then left the post office and went into the house and closed the door, the deputized men got their guns and went into the house. As they demanded surrender, the Fleming brothers grabbed their guns. The two sides began to fire upon each other. There were 13 men that had been hiding out in the house. They began to scatter, and several of them were shot in the confusion. Cal was shot to death by Big Ed Hall. Big Ed Hall and Doc Swindle were both wounded during the shootout. 
It was thought that Doc would not survive as he was shot through the neck and jaw, but he did recover from his injuries. John H. Branham would die of his injuries nine days later. Because of his death, the case against Preston McAlvin Fleming was ended. McAlvin would die on January the 14th, 1894, at the age of 25 years old. Cal would be buried in Boggs Cemetery in Boggs, Webster County, West Virginia. John Branham had fell on his back during the shooting when Heenan had aimed his gun to shoot John. There is confusion as to which man shot Heenan, John Branham or Ed Hall. The shot, according to Doc Swindle, hit the cylinder of the gun and split in half. One half of the shot went into the pistol and the other half striking Heenan. The shot split Heenan's arm up to the elbow and hand. Heenan was taken into custody. Heenan was refused medical treatment until he confessed to the murders that had taken place in Pound Gap, Virginia. According to the story found in Charles Johnson's book, Heenan had went to trial. On July 24, 1895, there was a six-day trial in which a jury returned a verdict of not guilty against Heenan. This was because the only witness to the crime, Jane Mullins, had died, and the forced confession was denied as evidence. There is conflicting stories upon this. There was no trial, but in the preliminaries of the trial, it is also told that Heenan's confession was thrown out of court because it was made under duress. His medical treatment was withdrawn from him until he made a full confession. This action taken by the deputies was deemed illegal as well as Jane Mullins had died before the trial. So the prosecuting attorney dropped the charges against Heenan. Heenan would return to West Virginia and would die in 1943 in Caudill, Nicholas County, West Virginia at the age of 77 to 78 years old. Clifton Branham was born on Cabin Creek in Letcher County, Kentucky sometime during the year of 1861. He was one of nine children born to John C. and Mahala Mosley Branham. John moved his family quite a bit between Wise and Dickerson counties in Virginia and Letcher and Pike counties in Kentucky. When Clifton turned 16 years old, he fell in love with his second cousin, Nancy Nan Branham. Nan was born on November 15, 1862 at Pound, Wise County, Virginia. She was one of five children born to Tandy and Martha Elizabeth Robertson Branham. The two eloped together because Nan's mother, Martha, was against the Union sometime during 1877 to 1878. Martha felt that Clifton's reputation and their ages would not make a successful marriage. There are four children born to the marriage, Ida, George, Elsa, or Lizzie, and Mima who died at the age of three. Ida would marry David Fleming. George would marry Maggie Vanover. After the marriage, Clifton then began moonshining and would often get into trouble with the law. This trouble would force Clifton to move his family quite a bit between Kentucky and Virginia. Also, during this time, Clifton would use the alias George Jones to see several ladies in the area. It seems that during his stretches away from home, Clifton never lacked for female company. From September 1880 until August 1884, Branham had joined with the Hatfield faction of the Hatfield and McCoy feud. During this time, he was involved in killing of three men, Mac McCoy, George Mounts, and Jim Mason, who were all on the McCoy faction of the feud. Mason would be killed on Blackberry Creek in Pike County. A peace agreement was made between the two feuding families and Branham returned to Elkhorn Creek when it was over. Clifton Branham robbed and killed a man named Justice in October of 1886. After the crime was committed, Branham tried to escape the area. Branham was captured two months later in the state of Texas. After being returned to the state of Virginia, Branham faced trial and was given a six-year sentence in the penitentiary. Upon his release, he returned to Elkhorn Creek. The often told tale is that Clifton, his brother Tandy, and George Johnson were hired by Ira Mullins to kill Henry Vanover. 
On page 8 of the Kentucky newspaper, the Hazel Green Herald, dated Friday, August the 12th, 1887, is two sentences. They simply tell us that Clifton Branham and his brother Tan are in jail, charged with the killing of Vanover. They have made a confession implicating several others. Clifton received a life sentence for the crime. Tandy would later be released to an asylum as being judged as insane. For more information, please see The Henry Vanover Story, The Untold Tales, Part 2. Sometime in 1889, Clifton would also be released under a plea of insanity and would spend 12 years in prison for the murder of Henry Vanover. According to the Clifton Branham Find a Grave site, Branham was found guilty of the murder of Vanover and would be sentenced to life in prison at the Kentucky State Penitentiary at Frankfurt. The site claims that while serving his time, Branham got converted to Christianity and began preaching to others incarcerated with him. After serving 14 years of his life sentence, Branham was released on parole. That is because Kentucky enacted a new law that stated that any prisoner who served 10 years or more could be paroled. During the rest of his life, Clifton would deny that he had killed Henry Vanover. However, he would confess to receiving money for the shooting. If Ira Mullins did pay for the murder of Henry, there is no evidence that we could find other than the assertions of others claiming that he did so at the time of this article. Upon his release from a life sentence for his part in the killing of Henry Vanover, Branham spent the first six months out of jail going back to his moonshine and wild women. It is reported that in June 1902, Clifton Branham moved to Wise County, Virginia, where he married Miss Sarah Bond, who was a widow. At this time, no records could be found concerning this marriage. However, as more information becomes available, we will update our website. For a few months, Clifton and Sarah lived happily together on Bow Camp Creek, Virginia. In December of that year, Sarah came down with what is known as sore eyes and almost became blind. It is not clear what the diagnosis would be by today's standards. An altercation between Clifton and his second wife occurred when she was beaten almost to death and shot with his Colt's revolver. It is unclear from the newspaper articles if Sarah survived her injuries or not. It is also unclear on the whereabouts of Clifton for the next 10 days. On December 22, 1902, a family squabble happened between Clifton, Nancy, and or Ida and her husband David Crockett Fleming. It is not clear if it was David or Ida who was present at the squabble. During the disagreement, Nancy was beaten almost to death and Clifton took out his gun and shot and killed her and left her body laying in the middle of the road. Nancy Branham was 40 years old at the time of her death. Clifton Branham would flee to Floyd County, Kentucky for the next six months. While in Floyd County, Clifton would once again find love with a second cousin named Haley McCary. There is not a lot of public information available about John or Haley, but this is the story about them that is summarized from the Clifton Find a Grave website. The story goes that Clifton fell in love with Haley and asked for her hand in marriage from her father. John McCary was his first cousin to Clifton Branham. John would agree to the union, but with a condition. Clifton would have to kill a man for John. The name of the man was Hence Moore on Beaver Creek, Floyd County, Kentucky. However, the story is told that Clifton did as he was asked. Clifton then married Haley. It is also reported that for three days after the death of Moore that Branham would go to the grave of Moore and fire volley after volley of gunshots into his grave. The sheriff of Floyd County was summoned of this act. After getting married for the third time to Haley, Clifton decided that he would move to the state of Michigan in order to begin a new life. His new bride was with him aboard the train when Clifton Branham was recognized. After gathering 50 men, the sheriff met Branham at the White House train station in Johnson County as he was departing for Michigan. A posse apprehended him and John Wesley Hillman and Emmett Swindell brought him back to the Wise County Courthouse to face trial. On January 28, 1903, the case of the Commonwealth of Virginia v. Clifton Branham indictment for murder began. The case was continued until May 27, 1903, at which time the public defender, John A. Hughes, was assigned to defend Branham. 
The jury returned a guilty verdict after listening to all the evidence of the case. On September 25, 1903, Branham faced the gallows. He was given time to address the 4,000 people in attendance of his execution. He confessed to the crowd what happened during the time his wife was slain. According to the Courier Journal, then Branham asked the crowd two questions. The first question was, if anyone in the crowd felt that he was not justified, he would look for the one to hold his hand up. Not a single hand went up in the air. The second question that Branham asked was, all who felt that they would have done as he did, to hold up their hands, immediately an estimated 500 hands went up into the air. He is buried at Short Earl in Osborne Gap, Clintwood, Dickerson County, Virginia. Thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we bring to you the history of the Appalachian Mountains. Please like, subscribe, and share below. Also hit the bell for notifications of future videos. And once again, be sure to leave us a hey y'all in the comments section below.